Good evening, Friendship Wesleyan Church. Welcome to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15 is a wonderful chapter that we will discuss and talk about tonight. It is one of my favorite chapters because in Luke chapter 15, we are talking about the lost. All of Luke 15 is about the lost. So before we actually get started, just want to give you a small overview of what we talked about last week and a few of the theological themes that Luke talks about. The first one is salvation, which is God and his work that drives the narrative. And the biggest thing part of this as we start this Lenten season is the journey to Jerusalem in which Jesus is about, is about proclaiming God as father. And then Jesus is God's son. He's the main character that describes salvation. And then responding to God's kingdom, conversion, and repentance. They are fitting responses to the message of salvation in Luke. John the Baptist's job description was calling sinners, was uh, calling people to be baptized and repent. Jesus, when he was challenged, are you the Christ? He says, sinners come to repentance. A few other notes, women. Women have a high role in the book of Luke, and we're going to see that a little bit more tonight in chapter 15. But we'll get back to that a little bit later. And then Israel, the idea, the concept, the beliefs of the Jewish people, they can actually be misread, misinterpreted. And we see that throughout some of the different instances that Jesus, that Luke alludes to when he talks about Christ, when he talks about Jesus and his gospel. So here we go. The chapter of the lost. Luke 15 is the chapter of the lost. It starts with lost souls. At the very beginning of chapter 15, Luke makes a point to recognize that Jesus is talking with tax collectors and sinners. The Pharisees are grumbling about it because tax collectors and sinners are excluded from the religious community. They're people that you should not spend time with. And so Jesus hears him grumbling about this, and then he goes into his parables, the chapter. He goes into the stories of the chapter. We have the lost sheep the lost coin, and the lost son. So chapter 15 is very adequately shared as the chapter of the lost. And so the lost sheep, one of the biggest things here is for the Pharisees, the idea of Jesus being, the idea of shepherds was something that they didn't relate to. Shepherds were considered unclean. And this story of the lost sheep, of what Jesus talks about with the shepherd who leaves his flock in the open country to go find the lost sheep, makes a specific point that other teachers of his time were not talking about. Other teachers, other rabbis would stress God's forgiveness but they want to talk about how God wants to seek out the lost. God rejoices in finding the lost. Here's a, uh, it's basically just a generic painting of a biblical shepherd. We can always, we can basically allude to that this is probably Jesus, but this is how a shepherd would, cat, would carry a lost sheep on his shoulders with his legs crossed over his chest to ensure that the shepherd that the, that the sheep would not stray off again. And just another note, when it talks about the shepherd loses, leaves the 99, the shepherds typically traveled in groups. They had others that would support them and to help them care for the flock. And so the shepherd the shepherd within this parable who leaves to seek out the lost sheep would be considered lead shepherd, the guide, the one in which they all would follow, but his friends would 
be there helping them with the rest of the flock and they would be looking over the 99 to bring them back in. The next parable, story of the lost coin. Another instance in which Luke uses a woman as the main character. And if you follow parable of the lost sheep, we're talking about one out of 99 sheep. When we reach this lost coin, we're talking about one out of 10. And so the value of the lost item is increasing. It's Jesus is really working to stress his point even more. And so the 10 coins, 10 silver coins in which this woman has, it's most, like, most likely her dowry, her dowry for marriage, which means it's the one thing in which she owns, regardless of what happens in the marriage. If her husband decides to be done with her, she is guaranteed to have these 10 coins. And the fact that it's only 10 silver coins, which is roughly 10 days wages, signifies that she comes from a pretty poor family. And then archeological studies show us that uh, poor homes, they have many, many crevices where the coins could disappear and hide. And actually today we still find coins. We're able to date houses based off of the coins that we find that are found within these little crevices. So being from a poor family, being from a home that has a lot of deep pockets where coins could disappear, she would be desperate to find this coin and concerned that she would never find it again. When she finds it, she celebrates and the angels in heaven, they celebrate with the, when God finds the lost souls, when the lost come to Christ, come to God. Jewish tradition talks about angels taking great interest in God's workings on earth final parable and the biggest parable of the chapter is the parable of the lost son or more commonly known as the prodigal son. Prodigal son is a really cool story. It's a it's one in which we have all heard growing up and within the context of chapter 15 what we see here is that the prodigal son signifies the highest value. Our first story the lost sheep one out of a hundred, which the shepherd goes to to find. The second story of the lost coin, one out of ten. Now we're at the highest value. It's one out of two. It's the youngest son, the youngest son who is, um, who in Jewish culture would be, would be called to receive a an inheritance, but he would only be, he would receive a smaller inheritance than his older brother. Typically, the firstborn always receives a double portion of the inheritance, and then the rest are separated amongst the others. So in this instance, the son would receive a third of his father's wealth, a third of his property, a third of everything that he, he owns. And what the prodigal, and what this son does, what this youngest boy does, he turns to his father and goes, I want my inheritance now. And that would be the equivalent of saying, I wish you were already dead. I want you out of my life. And I want what you give, what you were to give me now. And so this father, he, he concedes, he, he, he gives it. He gives his inheritance to his youngest son who goes off to the far off country and he he lives there for a while. He extravagant, extravagantly uses his goods and, and squanders his wealth, his fortune. And the family comes through, which is a, a typical sign for economic depression. He finds himself working with pigs. And this is where it comes into where Jesus where the parable of Jesus coincides with a similar story from, sec from the second century in, in Jewish tradition. The boy gets what he deserves. Within the, uh, the, Jewish, within the Jewish story, the boy serving food to the pigs 
it's basically the moral you have upset your father you upset the family order you deserve to be nothing and this boy's desire his his desperation to eat the pig's food it would disgust jewish hearers pigs were considered unclean it was considered something that they should not that they stay away from completely this would be absolutely disgusting and so the moral of the story is you upset your father you're going to be with the pigs but here's where jesus where the story that jesus shares is different the son returns to the father returns to his father's estate but here's the real question did he return out of humility or did he return out of hunger so we look at this again if you look at the passage and read it it starts with the young man looking at the pods that the pigs eat and he turns and goes you know in my father's house, even the servants have enough bread to eat. He was starving. So then he turns and says, I will go to my father and I will ask to be a hired servant. Turn to him and say, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Please allow me to be like a hired servant basically going thinking about if i could just get that bread that my father gives to the servants i could live again and we know the rest of this we know the next part of the story he makes a long journey back to his father's estate his father sees him a distance away and runs out to, to meet him. His dignity is squandered by running. He has to hike up his cloak and to run. And then he turns and says, give my son the choicest robes. Give him the family ring. Put shoes on his feet. And in essence, he's basically saying, you are back in the family. And as the son turns and goes, I've sinned against you and I've sinned against heaven. Please take me as a hired hand. The father turns and goes, I will only receive you as a son, not a servant. You will not be a hired hand. You are back in the family. You are a, my son. He calls out. Kill the fattened calf, for my son has returned. We must celebrate. You know, the fattened calf equals big party. The fattened calf is a special animal that was saved and was fed so that they may be eaten for times of great celebration, like a, a boy becomes a man or or a wedding in the family. It means a big, big party. And generally the, the surrounding village would be invited to this party. So this is a big deal. When he says the fat and calf, he's talking about the best we have. Bring it out for my son. And so then we get to get, so as this party starts up and everybody is celebrating, the elder son who's been working in the field, he's, he's coming home. <laughs> He sees all this, but he doesn't go in. He doesn't go into the party. He stays outside. The elder son is a clear metaphor for the Pharisees. See, in Jewish culture, the elder son, if there's a dispute between father and younger children, the oldest is supposed to work it out. They're supposed to work as a mediator between them. And also, when the father turns to speak with the elder son, the elder son does not address him with anything. He's, he's angry. He's upset. And now he's disrespecting his father for what he's done. 
And so there's, there's many different elements, many different things in which Jesus is talking about with the elder son who has always been with the father. The Jews, the Jewish people, God has been there. He has chosen them. The Pharisees, they have been with God. But they wanted more. They wanted a celebration about for the lost. But the celebration was reserved for the lost at the return. And God said, I will celebrate when anyone returns to me, comes to faith. So as we uh, prepare to finish up our time here in our study, I just want to share one picture with you. This is, this is a fairly popular painting by uh, Rembrandt on the return of the prodigal son. Clearly, it's not culturally, historically accurate to the time in which Jesus lived. It's more about Rembrandt's time from the 1600s. But just look at the painting. Look at the life that you see within it. The father kneeling over, embracing his son, who's in rags, who's, who's barefoot, who has no hair in anything. And you have others looking upon this scene with, with their own, with their own eyes, seeing one of the dignified rejoicing in dignity. And then up in the corner, you can kind of see back in the shadows. It's a little bit difficult to see up in the left-hand corner. There's the depiction of the older son looking on with anger, some fury. This was Rembrandt's interpretation of the embrace of the prodigal son. The painting was called The Return of the Prodigal Son the light, the shadows, everything. The brightest part of the painting is on the father with his son. And the darkest is on the elder son who's angry at the celebration. When we think about our, our spiritual journeys, when we think about our, our relationship with God, I think it's important for us to remember who we are within the story. Whether you're someone who's followed Christ, who's been a devout Christian for years, decades, or whether you're someone that's new to the faith, it's always important to remember who God is and that he celebrates when the lost come home. And we just have to take our own time to remember, to remember that Christ came to seek and save the lost, as Luke 19, 10 tells us. That sinners come to repentance is his greatest joy. And that not only does he seek out those who are on the mar margins, those who are already considered lost by the world. That is God's message for us. The story of Luke 15 is to remember that heaven celebrates when the lost are found. Thank you for listening to my thoughts, my observations on Luke chapter 15. Hope you have enjoyed your, your time listening with me and look forward to seeing your comments and your thoughts and final observations that you guys may have seen throughout the chapter that we didn't discuss today. I look forward
forward to listening, to reading the comments, to find what you guys have considered and thought yourselves. And for next week, read chapter 16, study chapter 16. Let us pray. As we finish our time here tonight, let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift that you give us. We thank you for never giving up on us. No matter how lost we are, no matter how marginalized we may be, that you love us, that you never give up looking for us. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your your love and your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody, thank you. Have a great week.